So I'm gonna bend this down a little bit. You guys are all naked right now, I'm just saying now. <laughs> yeah! Yeah! So are you! Yeah, thank you. And I want to bring you home and sleep with you all. Uh, okay, so this is my, uh, my, my first book, it's called Super Survivors. To be fair, when I was asked to do this, I hadn't been published yet, so I was barely published. Right. So now, I, I, this just came out this summer. And it's a bestseller! My co author is actually at the table over here, David Feldman, and uh, we had a blast writing this book. It's about people who dramatically change their lives after experiencing a traumatic event. So I, if I were to take a show of hands, I would assume that people have experienced ups and downs in their lives, and this is about why people change and how they change and the remarkable things that they do. So, um, super survivors. And this first uh, story, the story that I'm going to read is uh, about this uh, amazing woman who now lives in San Francisco. Uh, but she barely made it out of Rwanda alive, and uh, um, it kind of dovetails really nicely with Patrick's um, piece um, in the sense that it's all about, uh, well, you'll see. Let me know what you think. So growing up in the city of Kigali, Rwanda's capital, Clementine Womeria was an inquisitive little girl. In fact, her unending wonder at the world around her caused her uh, endlessly loving parents to want to put tape over her mouth. I remember driving through the city and the whole way asking my mother, who lives here? Who lives in that house? My mother made up stories from one house to the other. I wanted to know everything. With a short nose, high cheekbones, and a slender physique, Clementine at 24 is striking. The first thing people often notice is her distinctive wide-eyed smile. She wears her hair in a dozen long Rwandan braids tied behind her head. Have you guys seen these things? They're beautiful. It's gorgeous, gorgeous things. Her skin is the color of dust of a dust storm, and she speaks with a yearning cadence that infuses wonder and horror as she talks about the events that began in 1994, only shortly after the drive through the city with her mother. She was six when the mass killing started in Kigali. The first thing they do is rape the girls, Clementine says, drawn back into the memory of the genocide, and ethnic tensions were brimming in Rwanda when a government assassination sparked the start of Hutu-conducted mass killings of Tutsi and pro-peace sympathizers. Trying to protect her and her 16-year-old sister Claire, their parents placed them in hiding at their grandparents' home, but Clementine's grandparents couldn't protect the girls from, from violence for long. She remembers the beginning of the massacre in snippets. The house was cold, the darkness was impenetrable. The night ushered in sounds of annihilation, howling, and bawling from the streets. There was just lots of noise and banging outside, she says. There was singing, actual singing, from the mob coming down the avenue as they broke into the houses. I heard crying in the dark. From inside or outside, I'm not sure, but then the screaming was in, uh, then screaming, and I was in a corner, shaking near my grandmother's bedroom. Claire and I scrambled in the dark, trying to find places in the house to hide. We just didn't know where to go. The sisters crept through the airless hallway to the far side of the house, and Claire stopped short of the kitchen and opened a tiny window. From there, the sisters escaped to the yard and slipped into a darkness of a field of banana trees. Then Clementine had a sudden horrible thought. She turned back to the house, but Claire yanked her deeper into the forest still, seemingly incapable of stopping to consider the family that they left behind. Claire lifted her sister up the trunk of a tall tree and ordered her to climb. And up the yawning branches, time atrophied. Clementine imagined transforming herself into a boulder, an inanimate piece of earth whose elements were frozen in time, anonymous and impermeable. All around them, far below, deafening shrieks and cries split the darkness as roaming death squads slaughtered neighbors with laser-like exactitude. Much as they had all over the city that night and throughout the country, Far away, I could see fire and smoke rising above the trees, she says. I didn't know if my house was on fire, too, and we waited for my grandparents to get out. And here she pauses to find her next words. This will never make sense to me. What we saw, so much death. My parents and my grandparents never came out. In the morning, Clementine and Claire emerged from the trees. They walked roads clogged with people laying motionless in the gutters. Needing a place to store the dead, houses of worship were converted into storerooms where bodies were piled floor to ceiling. Across the city, houses smoldered. Clementine and Claire joined other displaced victims of ongoing assaults and walked many days to a refugee camp in Burundi. We found ourselves in a place neither of us had ever imagined, surrounded by thousands of others, all wounded, lost, screaming, crying, and hungry, all in shock, all in disbelief. 
Clementine says, and together she and Clara stood in long lines for a tent, blankets, and sacks for their belongings. She and her sister stayed in the camp roughly a year, during which time Hutu massacred an additional 800,000 Tutsi. Life as a ref well, let me start over here. When Clementine was a child, her nanny told her a story about a lost little girl. This story, by the way, was phenomenal. It just, it just made me and my co-author just tear up when we heard it. Um, so when Clementine was a child, her nanny told her a story about a lost little girl. But this little girl was different from all other girls. Born of a thunder god and a mortal woman, when this girl smiled, glass beads and buttons fell from her lips. And so the lost little girl smiled through her fear, knowing that her mother would follow the glimmering trail to find her again. I saw myself as this lost little girl in the story, Clementine explains. In the refugee camp, she wrote her name on walls to mark her way in the hope that her parents might follow the trail back to their daughter. But as she moved from country to country, she walked streets looking for people's faces. Maybe I'll see someone that looks like me and I'll know it's my parents. Life in the refugee camp was unbearable. Over the next six years, she relocated to the Democratic Republic of the Congo. When war erupted there, they fled to Tanzania to escape, um, then to camps in Malawi, Mozambique, South Africa, and finally Zambia. In 2000, Clementine and her sister worked with the International Organization for Migration to obtain refugee status in the US. And that summer, they boarded a plane from Zambia to Zurich, where the passengers looked clean and well-dressed. From Zurich, she flew to Washington, D.C., feeling more lost than ever, and the last leg of their journey brought them to Chicago. I was filled with mixed emotions, she says. I was happy to leave the horror, but I worried I'd never see my mom and dad again. When I was traveling from camp to camp, I would count how many mountains I passed so I could find my way back home. In a plane, I couldn't leave any trace of me behind to let them know where I had gone. In 2001, though, there came two revelations. Clementine's sister Claire had recently met a Rwandan businesswoman in Chicago, and together they made a nearly impossible connection. The woman had a friend back in Rwanda who, oddly enough, knew a friend of theirs, an aunt, an aunt who they thought had been murdered. That night, Clementine sat in the corner of the living room and watched Claire dial. It was silent for a long time, Clementine says. Then Claire started talking into the phone, and she smiled, and I knew it was her. It was my aunt. She was alive. And then her aunt said something that turned Claire's face to stone. Their parents were alive and in Rwanda. And this is where it starts to get really cool. <laughs> so the second revelation came in the form of Ellie Wiesel's memoir, Night, uh, which we've all read, and from which Clementine first learned the word genocide. Wiesel's survival in the Nazi concentration camps was a revelatory um, uh, understanding to Clementine. He was the first person to describe accurately the pain and confusion she herself had endured. In fact, Clementine was so moved that she wrote an essay for a contest put on by none other than Oprah Winfrey. It's about the scar of genocide that marred both Germany and Rwanda. And a few months later, she was shocked to learn that her essay was a finalist, earning her a seat and a taping on the program. On the day of the taping, Clementine put on a black pantsuit with wide lapels. She drove her sister with her sister to Harpo Productions in the near west side of Chicago. The set was smaller than it looked on television. But partway through the taping, Oprah did something well. Very Oprah. Right. So she invited Clementine and her sister Claire to join her on stage. Oprah was holding an envelope. This is from your family in Rwanda, she said, and I want you to read it. Oprah handed her the envelope, and Clementine slipped her finger along the opening. But Oprah put her hand on Clementine and said, you don't have to read it now in front of all these people because your family is here. Clementine's breath disappeared. Claire reached her arms out um, into the air to try to balance herself from falling. Behind the sisters, a panel slid open, and their parents rushed out to embrace them. Unbeknownst to the sisters, Oprah producers had worked weeks to locate Clementine's parents and then float them out to reunite with their children. I fell on the floor, Clementine recalls. I raised my hands up and said, thank you, God. I squeezed my father and held my mother. No one had seen this private pain in me that I'd been carrying for 12 years. The girl who smiled, smiled beads, cried, and mourned. I let it go. The pain was gone. I could forgive, she says. I could forgive. I could forgive. But Clementine's journey toward forgiveness had begun years before her parents on Oprah. Shortly after arriving in the United States, she picked up a strange new hobby. 
Patrick, this might sound familiar. Every day, she collected newspapers and saved the obituaries of strangers. She amassed hundreds of names, folding the pages and keeping them safely in her bedroom closet. Clementine now recognizes this as one symptom of a general obsession with memory. She was disturbed by the fact that what had happened to her, her family, and hundreds of others um, in Rwanda might not be remembered, honored, or mourned. In stark contrast, the names in the obituaries were being recorded and honored, she says, her eyes pooling with tears. They were not buried in unmarked holes in the dirt. Someone cared enough to write about the dead. Now, during her junior year at Yale University studying comparative literature, Clementine joined Oprah to travel to South Africa to, uh, to speak at the Oprah Winfrey Leadership Academy for Girls. And in a letter home to friends, Clementine later wrote, I'm not afraid as, of the future as I used to be because of these, uh, of these places. I'm not um, of places like this school, which are creating leaders who listen. I cannot wait to see the students in action once they have built the strong intellectual foundation I've seen here. I'm inspired. Now, Clementine writes that forgiveness is a journey, and not necessarily one that she has fully com completed. The journey, however, continues to teach her how to be a whole person again. And today, she brings this message to people all over the world when she lectures before audiences at the UN, at the US Department of Homeland Security, and even in high school assemblies. On October 28, 2011, Barack Obama appointed Clementine to a key post as a member of the US Holocaust Memorial Council alongside her hero, Elie Wiesel. Yet no accomplishment, title, or feat of super survival has made the past fade from Clementine's memory. On quiet nights in her dorm room, she still thinks about the screaming in the forest, but she is not, uh, she is not bound to that past. She has found ways to channel that tragedy into great accomplishments, hopeful forays into the future she's determined will be better. Besides accumulating obituaries, Clementine collects vintage buttons. Now, buttons are remarkably simple and beautiful objects of metal, glass, pearl, and bead. More than just fashion trimmings, they serve the specialized purpose of fastening and keeping, keeping things together. Today, when bad memories come flooding back, Clementine calms her mind in the act of sewing the buttons into bracelets of tight piles on six-inch strips of heavy fabric. She wears these buttons and bead bracelets on her arms. Can you see the anger behind the bracelets when you look at them, she says? See, I have transformed the anger into something beautiful. The girl who smiled beads now wears them on her wrists. Thank you.